Okie dokie, I think we're probably going to get going um, about now, so I think that seems fair. Right then, so this is our last session of the day. Um, thank you all for being here and still being standing after three arduous days. Um, and this is a treat. This is stuff that I absolutely genuinely love. I'm pretty nuts about this stuff. Um, and it's different. Um, don't expect anything. If you're not familiar with Baijiu at all, this, is, this stuff is just different. It doesn't pretend to be anything other than itself, and itself is very different from any Western spirits that you may or may not have had. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through some of the production techniques that are used. Now, we simply don't have the time to go through all of the involved production processes because they are horrendously complicated, but we can go through some of the kind of the key stuff. Some of this is going to seem odd. Trust me, it works. Um, but don't expect to be in familiar territory. Who's just out of interest? Who's had any by Joe before? Ah, oh, splendid. Okay, so a few. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, as a, as a broad overlier, it's an enormous category. It's the biggest spirits category globally. Most of it doesn't leave China. Um, there are a fair few of them, and they quite like drinking it. Um, what exports that do currently happen are mostly going into Chinese expat parts of the world. So it's not widely understood, um, and it's taken us at the WSC a long time to find the right connections, to find the right understanding, to be able to communicate this the way we would like to. Um, it's made from grains. That's the star of ten. It's a grain distillate. Um, sorghum is the most commonly used grain, but there are plenty of others that are used. Um, and most Baijiu will be this colour. Um, however, quite a lot of it will have gone through an ageing process as well. Oak or wood ageing of any sort is really not part of the tradition of production there at all. But ageing in ceramic or kind of pottery earthenware vessels is an intrinsic part of what happens. So, yes. What? By Joe. Um, clear alcohol, I think. Um, yeah. So, in broad, broad brushstrokes, that's what it is. It's a grain spirit, it's produced very differently. It, some of it, and most of it, will be aged for a period of time. Some of it is actually very long aged, like decades worth of aging, but it won't come out with a colour because it, it doesn't have it. It's not being aged in a vessel that will give it colour. So, what we need to understand for a starter is what is a grain. So, a grain is essentially an embryonic plant with a granary attached. It's got, there's a plant in there that wants to grow and it's supplied by its parent plant with a source of food. And that source of food comes in the form of starch. Now, starch is one of the most common sources of carbohydrate globally and that starch is there specifically for that baby plant. But because we're pesky and human, we've decided that we want to take use of that but we can't use starch, Nothing, no one can use starch until it's broken back down into its fundamental structure, which is glucose, which is one of the kind of the very simple sugars. So this is quite an arduous process, but it's worth kind of looking at the steps, comparing that with what happened in more familiar territory, as in what happens within, say, malting, and then see what's done differently, okay? So here we have starch granules. Now starch granules is what is stored in the grain. When you crush it up, it becomes flour. Um, that's kind of what flour is, essentially. Um, and these starch granules in grains are stored in a protein, they're kind of stored in a protein net. They're kind of, kind of stored in an orderly fashion. So in order to get to these starch granules, first of all, we have to destroy this net. The plant will do that quite naturally using enzymes that it will grow itself. Um, and that's a process called modification, and there it goes. It's, t it's taken away that protein net. Now, some of you who may be familiar with bourbon, grains are cooked. Cooking of grains will do the self same thing, but it can be done enzymatically. So during malting, the plant will do that for itself. If it doesn't, it can't get at the starch which it's been supplied with, so it would be a fairly foolish piece of design if it couldn't do that. Um, so now that these starch granules are exposed, 
they need to be opened up. Now, as humans, we're very impatient, so we need to speed this process up. So to speed that process up, we will do something called gelatin, we will gelatinize this starch. Basically, we'll heat it up. Now, plants don't do this for themselves. They don't cook themselves. Um, these, these starch granules will very slowly and naturally unwind over time and drip feed the plant with food but we will cook them and it was a process called gelatinization. If anyone here has made a sauce and they've put flour or put corn flour into that and it thickens up, that is exactly what's happening. The starch granules are unraveling and then they make this liquid quite thick. Um, so we've all seen that process at work uh, and that's essentially what's happened. So another uh, sensational PowerPoint animation here. Um, there it is, it unravels, you're welcome. Yes, I know end of the day. Now, once you've got to this point, we can now start breaking this starch apart. And that's where you need enzymes. And these enzymes can come from multiple different sources. You've got them in your mouth. Most animals will produce them, because if they don't, they won't be able to access starch. So, this is a process in its fancy term called enzymatic hydrolysis. Amylases are the things you need. That in itself is a whole talk, but we'll skip over that. Um, and then we'll end up with glucose, okay? Now, if you're familiar with the malting process, that's what the plant is releasing during malting. It's releasing these enzymes, so that when you crush it up and you make a wash, the enzymes will activate and break the starch down and produce the sugar for you. Now then, this is a process that you're likely to be relatively familiar with. If you're in Europe, You'll take a grain, principally barley. Now there are other techniques, but we'll just look at malting. You'll malt it, during which time the modification will take place, the protein that's broken apart. The plant will also release the amylase enzymes. You'll then smash it to pieces, and you'll put it in a warm, warm water, um, and that will gelatinize the starch. If you ever see that happen, you'll see this thing thickening up as it's heated up, and then the enzymes will go about breaking the starch down into sugar. And then you'll end up with a sugary liquid. Splendid, we can now do fermentation. You'll have yeast added, and there will be a liquid state fermentation. This is all stuff we're fairly familiar with. This is a sequence. We've gone from grain, malt, mash, we've got a sugary liquid, now we add yeast, and as sure as night follows day, we end up with an alcoholic liquid. So it's a sequential process. One step follows another, follows another, follows another, we end up with what we want. Splendid. Okay, this doesn't do that at all. So, what we're going to have to encounter here is something fundamentally different. You're going to start off with a grain, either a single grain or multiple grains when you're making bijo, um, and you'll steam them. You'll steam them, which is a cooking process, which will gelatinize the starch. Splendid, that's now all unraveled, super duper. And to this grain, which is quite often not crushed, still left whole, you will add fungal enzymes and yeast. And everything happens at the same time. So this is a parallel fermentation process. So the enzymatic hydrolysis, the alcoholic fermentation is happening at the same time. So sugars are being made at the same time as the sugars are being consumed by the yeast. So it's called a parallel process, it's a parallel fermentation. And that is fundamentally different from what you're probably mo more used to, which is this, which is a sequential process. And at the end of that, we'll end up with an alcoholic solid, quite often, which in itself is a bit of a mind bend, um, or sometimes a liquid as well. So we're dealing with a very, very different process. So we can break into some of these bits. We can't do it all, but we can break into some of these bits. And the first bit I want to look at is this fungus business. So, sorry, I'll go back, take some more pictures. No, okay, that's spoiled too, never mind. Right, so, what we need to think about is what a fungus is up to. Probably not the, you probably thought you were gonna hear today, but there we are. Um, so, these fungi are after food. They're fairly straightforward creatures, just like the rest of us, we need to be sustained. So on they go, and they find themselves on, this star on a starchy surface. As long as it's warm and damp enough, they will start to grow. Um, and these are particularly called filamentous fungi. They will grow filaments into the starch. Now then, 
when I eat food or when you eat food, it kind of goes into us into our kind of digestive system, and our digestive system will secrete a whole load of chemicals onto that to break it apart. That's all happening somewhere inside, and then other stuff happens. Now, with this fungus, what it's doing is it's growing into its food, secreting its digestive juices, having a little play, and then absorbing all of the stuff that's been broken down by it. So it's growing into its food. That's what it's doing. It doesn't have a digestive system, it just does it all externally. Um, isn't life wonderful? Now, it's producing a whole source of different enzymes, including the amylases that are required for breaking up starch. Um, that stuff will happen, and then the filaments will then absorb the nutrients that it's made for itself. So far, so good. Now, because we're pesky and human, we've decided, aha, I'm going to use those enzymes for my own purposes. So what you do is you encourage these fungi to grow, release their enzymes, and then kind of stop them from growing by essentially putting them into um, drier conditions where they just simply don't like to grow. And then you can use those enzymes as you will. So whereas in, say, whiskey production, you might be used to thinking, well, the whole point of malting is to release the enzymes from the plant, here they're using fungal enzymes. So that's what they're doing. Now, this is what you end up with. What they will do is they will crush up grains and they will allow ambient cultures of fungi, yeast, bacteria and all sorts of other things to then just like grow quite naturally within these compressed parcels of crushed grain material. Um, and you have big chew, so the QU there is said to chew. You've got big chew and you've got small chew and predictably enough that's the big one and that's the small one. Um, they're made from different grains. There are, some, there are a number of variations within that process which we really don't have the time to go into, more's the pity. But essentially, they will get these, form them into shapes, store them in quite kind of humid, warm places, allow this culture to grow through, move them into drier places, and they can then be stored for a period of time and until they're used. So there's a constant production of this stuff which is called chew. So for these particular forms, they are going to supply not only the yeast, they will supply the enzymes that are required, as well as bacteria. So they are the primary source of sort of all of the things that are needed for a fermentation to take place. Okay? Small chew is typically made from rice, that can be made from wheat, and it can be made from other stuff as well. So it, the, the ingredient sources are quite varied for, for this. Um, and when you see sort of storerooms of this, there are enormous storerooms that are filled with bricks of big chew. Um, and then when they're used, they get crushed up and they'll get used. Now then, that's chew. Now we need to deal with this, solid state fermentation. All right, here we go. So you're used to this kind of, well, I'm assuming, this is a fairly predictable kind of fermentation. It's in a liquid. There are millions of yeast cells in there. Um, any kind of raw material can be used for this, as long as it, you've got some sugar that's then dissolved. Thank you very much. Off it goes. Um, now, you might ask yourself, well, how does the yeast move around this? Well, essentially, the yeast moves around it by filling its filling. The, it's completely full of yeast cells. Um, I mean, it can move around with convection, but the very fast kind of growth phase of the yeast means that they essentially populate that entire volume of liquid. Um, but it kind of has a kind of a familiarity to it. Now then, the next stage along is what would be called semi-solid state fermentation. Now this is, does happen for some baijiu. It is also how all sake is made and many of the Japanese um, shochu are made using this technique. Now, in there you will have some starchy material, typically a grain, it might be a potato, um, but you have some kind of starchy material that's been cooked, so the starch is all gelatinized. Into that as well, you will add some form of um, enzyme. So in Baijiu's case, that will be chew. Um, in other traditions, it's called other stuff. So what's happening there is that the enzymes are breaking apart these solid bits of starchy material. That then comes out into solution. The enzymes will work through that, create sugar, the yeast will ferment that. These take a lot longer to complete, for fairly obvious reasons. There's more stuff going on. 
Um, but it's still kind of understandable how the yeast will move through, how stuff will move through. It kind of feels that it's still a kind of a sloppy liquid. So um, this is a bit of a cheat. That's a sake fermentation, but it's exactly the same kind of thing. It kind of it's a flowing lumpy liquid. So it's a liquid. You can still get liquid in it, but it's really very lumpy and really quite obvious and obvious pieces of material. Now then. We then go on to the joys of what is called a solid state fermentation. So, first things first, this isn't a dry solid material. It has to be damp, it has to be warm, it has, it has to have moisture in there. If it wasn't, you wouldn't get anything going on. Because most living things need temperature and they need moisture, so you need both of those things to be there. But you don't have a flowing liquid. That's what you don't have. But, all of the grains that are going to go in there are going to be damp. They're going to have been steamed, they'll have been cooked, there will be moisture in there. And the chew will go in there as well. So it's all mixed up, crushed up, and then in it goes. And then typically this will take ball. It can take place in sealed vessels, it can be pits underground, or it can be large ceramic vessels, but they will always then be sealed. These fermentations take at least a month, um, and sometimes way longer than that. Um, and essentially all that is happening is the same as what's happening in a compost heap. In that, fungi, bacteria and yeast are just multiplying and growing through this material. And in so doing, the starch is converted to sugar, the yeast will ferment the sugar, and alcohol will be produced. So, and this is important for later on, as all this stuff is essentially decomposing, um, I'm not making this sound very attractive, but it is kind of fundamentally what's going on. Um, as this stuff's breaking down, it will form alcoholic liquid. Alcoholic liquid will form, and that just under gravity will kind of drift down. So you get more liquid at this level of these fermentation pits, and these levels tend to be drier. That has an impact later on, um, which we will discuss. But that's essentially what a solid state fermentation is. Um, it is just different, but it works. It doesn't produce an awful lot of alcohol, but, you know, never mind. And that's what it looks like going into a pit. So that's the grains, they've been cooked, they've been broken down, they've been put into a pit, and then they're sealed with mud, and they're just left. And nature does its thing. Now then, as if, hello. Yep. It, but it just it's still, yeah, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to come into a much more kind of low oxygen environment, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so for the, some of them, for the um, rice aroma, it will be semi-solid, it will be a little bit more open. But ultimately, once it's in the liquid, it's going anaerobic because you want them to be into that state. Because, because of the Crabtree effect, they tend, where they will go into that state. Because um, if they don't, then they won't produce any alcohol. Okay, now then, this is a still, and it's not like any still you've ever seen before. Um, so what you've got here is a relatively shallow vessel. It's been filled up with grains that have been dug out of that pit. So they've been dug out, they've got alcohol in them, they've got liquid in them, they've got a load of flavour in them. In it goes, and the bottom of this is kind of about here, broadly speaking, and then steam is injected from the bottom, okay? Now when it comes out of the pit, it's got about 5% ABV. That's not a very tall still. I think we can all agree with that. But what comes out of the top of that is about 85% ABV. Now, you say, how the bejesus does that happen? Or how does that happen? I don't know, you just might frame it some other way. But you cannot view that as a pot, although it looks a bit like a pot still, because that's the lid here, and it'll swing round and you're gonna put it on and it's got like a, like a thing going out the top through to a condenser. It really doesn't serve to consider this to be a pot still. You have to consider this as a packed column. So you can have columns with rectification plates in them, which is a kind of a quite a common thing that you'll see, but you can actually have columns that just have loads of material in them. And all that does is create a huge amount of opportunity for reflux to occur. Um, and they've mastered this over many centuries, and that's how it works. Um, so one distillation gets you from about 4% up to about 80 odd percent. Um, and it's pretty incredible. But it's not just it's not just that that's incredible. There's another little trick they've got up their sleeves as well. So if we just look at this a little bit more diagrammatically, hopefully this is helpful. 
We've got fermented grains. Now they will always mix it in with husks, um, grain husks, and that's just to make sure you get an even distribution of flow of the hot, hot, the hot steam through. So it brings everything. The whole point of this is you want to get the steam pulling everything out. So they found that by packing this in with husks, that that's, that's the way in which they can achieve that effect. This is the, many of the processes in bio production are now automated. This isn't, they have yet to find a way in which to automate this. These have to be hand loaded. And it's a very, considered to be a very high, high level of skill to load these in the correct way that you would actually get the correct result. Um, so, in it goes, fills up, steam comes through, and your spirit, you get a whole load of rectification occurring there and the spirit will come out the top. Now, if that's all that's gone in and you don't particularly want to do anything more with that grain, and this will happen in certain circumstances, off it goes. Okay, so far so predictable. This is where, and this is honestly a true act of genius. This is the next thing that you, we're gonna show you, true act of genius. Um, quite often, when they load up these stills, they will put in both fermented grains and grains that are entirely new to the system. They've been cooked, well they haven't been cooked, they've just been prepared, okay? So they're not, they haven't entered the system at all. The first thing you need to do to a grain is gelatinize the starch. And a very easy way to gelatinize the starch is to cook the grain. Well hang on, I've got a steam still here. I could distill and cook grains, I can get two for the price of one. Honestly, it's amazingly clever. So, and that's exactly and precisely what happens. So, in go the fermented grains, in go the new grains, in go the husks. Steam distillation occurs. Now, that will bring us, bring us out our new spirit, but we have the rectification going on, but for the stuff that's new, it's being gelatinized. Genius. And then, that, all of that will then go back into another pit and be used again. Um, the actual fermentation process isn't hugely efficient in terms of the extraction of all the fermentable materials in one batch of fermentation. So just throwing it away is probably a bad idea if it hasn't had several goes through a pit. So typically these things will then just go back into a pit again. But that's how you can keep adding, pro adding material in. So stuff is going into the still before it's even gone into the fermenter. But it's, but it's doing a different function. It's like you're using a steamer, both to distill and to cook the grain. So you're doing two things in one space. No. I'll answer that more fully or not. No. I'll, I'll explain later, because it, that requires more explanation. Um, okay, so this is, now, the, all of the stuff that we are gonna have today, the three samples we're gonna have today are all made using, using these traditional stills. Um, so I think that's enough of that. So we probably need to try, try some stuff, but these are the, so the, the Chinese government has, has subdivided Baijiu into these 12 categories. Now, these are by far and away the, the most important ones, and we're going to try three, one sample from each of three of those. So we're going to try a light and a sauce and a strong. Now, for the love of, the, of something that's very important to you, please taste these and smell these in the order as provided, because if you try to jump ahead to three, then honest to God, you won't smell anything in one. So just do go, go with these in order. So we've got strong sauce, light and rock. That's what we're going to have. Rice aroma is also very important. All of these three that we are going to have have gone through solid state fermentations um, and have been using the traditional Baijiu still. This other load of categories are variation, largely variations on a theme of the big four. Now, sadly, we don't have the time to go through all of these various things, and some of them are just made by one or maybe two distilleries at the tops, but these are the ones that we can focus on, okay? So, here we go. Now, light aroma, which is sample number one, is one of the hardest of the categories of Baijiu to kind of describe as sort of like a consistent method um, because it's very, very varied. So we don't, I can't really go into all of that various things, but there will be a variety of different raw materials used. The one we've got here is made solely from sorghum, but a variety of different grains will be used. Some of them will use big chew, some of them will use small chew. 
it's a, it's a, it's a choice and it's varied. Um, they will be solid state fermented, but they will be done in pottery vessels. They're not done in the pits, they're done in large pottery vessels. Um, and the traditional Baijiu stills are used. Now, um, it says light aroma for a reason, because these are the lightest kind of of the, of the main styles. But they are in themselves still very distinct and still very characterful. So the, what we've got here is Fenju, um, which is a sorghum light aroma. So what we need to do now is we need to kind of dive into sample number one and see what, see, see where, see what we find. Now, it's water white and colourless. There's no prizes for saying that. Um, and what we need to do is we need to kind of drill into some of these aromas. Now, if you're looking for clear cereal characteristics, they are not as obvious on the nose. They become a little bit more obvious on the palate. Um, but there's a whole lot of other stuff. So just give yourself a chance to have a quick sniff and a smell and have a think. And then we'll kind of talk about what it is you may or may not be smelling. Uh, that's a very good question and I really need to check. Um, 45. So. Um, a lot of them can be a lot higher than that, so actually it's quite a, quite a modest ABV. Okay. So. You don't tend to smell much by way of cereal notes on this, but there is this kind of big, kind of yogurty, lactic, slightly kind of milky set of aromas. Um, and there is something that you could define as fruity, but it's kind of on the slightly overripe, slightly kind of off kind of fruit. Um, and I actually really like this. This shows really well as that type. Um, what do people think just of that aroma? All right, do this as a show of hands, because I've got amplification, so I can cheat. Um, who finds that as an attractive smell? Neither one thing or the other. Dear Lord, why am I here? Okay, you know, good. Strap in. Um, so, we'll just give it a try now. Now, first things first, the texture on this. It has a real kind of granular, kind of almost kind of gritty feel to it which is quite an important way of contrasting out what is quite a kind of a, a coating mouth feeling kind of yogurty feel. Um, that grittiness will come from the way in which they've managed their heads and tails cuts. Um, in most circumstances, that will be considered problematic, but within the context of this, actually I think it provides actually quite a nice textural contrast. You get much more of a sense of the grain um, and of more of a kind of a cereal oatmeal kind of feel on the palate, but you also kind of get this kind of slightly overripe fruit and that kind of smell of bacterial activity. There are certain similarities that you might pull out into some of the more higher estered rums or into some of the kind of the more wild fermented mezcals. There are kind of, I'm not saying they smell like that at all, I'm just saying there might become elements that you can kind of relate across. Okay? So, the finish on that is pretty long, it has complexity to it. Um, and actually, I think that is absolutely delicious. Um, as a, as we, we, had a, we, had a, we had a couple of sessions prior to this um, where cocktails were being made out of it, and actually it's some really very successful um, kind of, as, as you, you were there, some very successful kind of a, sort of uses of that were made. This, I think, is a very... I don't like the idea of gateway things, because ultimately, if you kind of drink Blossom Hill Rosé, the chances of you ever going on and drinking very fancy wine is probably quite low. Um, this is a thing in and itself. It is light, it's appealing, it's much more widely consumed than, than the other two that we're going to come to, um, because it's a little bit more light and a little bit more appealing. Um, I think that's delicious, but I'm biased. So, who, who enjoyed that overall taste sensation? Okay. Who's neither one way or the other? And who's, why am I here? Okay. There's a lot of fence sitting going on here. Okay. Now then, 
So that's light aroma. Now what we're going to come to next is source aroma. Um, and that, the, the naming of this will become pretty obvious once you start smelling it and tasting it. Um, it's made from sorghum. It's made from high temperature big chew. That essentially means that the bacteria, the, the cultures that survive in high temperature chew are just a bit different. This is made in pits, used in a traditional um, still, and the, the kind of the principal area for it is around Guangzhou here. Now, um, it's a linear process. So you know, I was saying where well, things would go into the still and then they come back out again and go back into the go back into the pit. There's eight cycles of that, which will produce a variety of different spirits, which then go into being blended. Um, there will be aged elements going into this as well. So sometimes there will be quite young spirit going in, sometimes there will be very, very old spirit going in. Um, now, the consequence of this production and the kind of cultures that survive in it mean that what you end up with is something that has a very, very intense soy sesame set of aromas. Now, this is made by Maltai, which produces probably what is considered the classic expression of sauce aroma. Um, it is kind of the benchmark for that. Um, and you might think, oh look, they're, they're the benchmark producer, so they're going to be small and boutique. -y. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is an enormous, huge scaled production. Um, the production. There's nothing small about Baijiu production. It is enormous. And these huge distilleries can produce things of immense quality. Um, so small is best is just kind of booted fairly squarely into touch as a, as, a, as a working premise when you go to China. It's just simply not true. Now then, let's have a sniff of this. This is considerably more intense. Um, and you should be able to smell on this, this kind of very, very overt soy aroma and kind of burnt sort of cooked down sesame. Um, and I just love this smell. Um, and it really is very, very well articulated and very kind of precisely made. Um, there will be quite a lot of aged stock in this too, so it's not just fresh. So this is going to be made out of a blend of various different things. Um, this is pronounced and it will stick with you for a while. Okay, so let's give it a try. Again, you've got that slightly kind of grainy, kind of gritty texture to it, which gives a contrast. Um, it's incredibly savoury. Um, it has this intensely deep, dense soy sesame aroma. Um, some intensely fruit, there, there are some kind of dried, kind of rotten fruit within that. Um, and it's almost kind of marmite by the time you get through to the finish. If that's a cultural reference that may kind of skip everyone other than the Brits in the room. Um, marmite's great. Um, this is absolutely classic as an expression of sauce aroma. Um, and it is, in my opinion, absolutely breathtakingly good. Um, you have to kind of get used to this kind of, there's a sharpness in these, but there's also kind of a penetration in that aroma which is very unfamiliar. But think back to the first time when you kind of had intensely smoky mezcals or very smoky more whiskies. There's nothing more or less extreme about them than there is about this. It's just that this is extreme in a different way. Um, I was having a very smoky set of mezcals this morning and you've got that roast vegetable smoke fun. Well, that in itself is not too straightforward, obviously kind of attractive set of aromas. You have to acclimatise yourself to that. Similarly with this, um, you have to kind of kind of get your head around what these things are offering. Okay? But if I was to be pushed, this is my favourite category. I think sauce, I think, is an absolutely delight, delightful category. Um, so that's sauce aroma, that's the Maltai. Um, and it really is kind of absolute benchmark, yes. Um, it will be, uh, it will be almost be certainly length of age. Um, yes, almost certainly. Now then, strong aroma. You can either have sorghum strong aromas or mixed grain strong aromas. It's big chew. It's in pits. Now, what is particularly notable? It's worth just like seeing the crazy of this. 
is that Strong Aroma is done on a perpetual cycle. So there's no start or finish to the production of Strong Aroma. It's constantly recycling round and round and round. So there are fermentation pits that are used in China that have been in use for quite literally hundreds of years. They have been in production for that length of time. Stuff comes out, stuff goes through the still, more grains go in, goes back in, and it just goes round and round and round and round. So it really is a very, very unique process. Now, I will go through these delightful PowerPoint animations, but if you understand the idea that liquid drops down in the pit, um, hold that in your mind, and just remember that the still is being used to gelatinize and rectify at the same time. So here we go. Here is our illustrative pit. Um, these colours are just for illustrative purposes. That's just all they're there for and make it easy to see. And what they'll do is they'll enter the pit out into layers. So they'll take the top layer and make a pile, next layer and make a pile, put them so on. So here we've got four, just for the sake of it, you know, there's four. Now, for these next, for these bottom two, they will add in fresh grains for the bottom two layers only. Now this top layer will go round, it will be distilled. Now the top layer is the driest of the layers, it has the least of the aromatics in it because the aromatics will flow down with the liquid. So there's no new grains put into that, so they'll distill it, they'll collect the spirit and then they'll just discard the grains. So now I've made space in my pit. The second layer will go through and they'll produce a second spirit and then they'll add fresh, now because they've distilled it, they've killed all the microbes in there, so they need to put more microbes back in, so they'll put in some fresh chew and they've now got another pile ready to go back in the pit. Now with these next two layers, we've got bigger piles, but that's got the new grains in it. So off they'll go, we'll produce, we'll produce a new spirit, we'll gelatinize the new grains, we'll add some more fresh chew. Thank you very much. And the same for this layer. So out of this kind of schematic, we produced four spirits out of one pit. Um, and the stuff that's come off the bottom layer will be considered to be much more attractive, much, will have much, much more of the intense characteristics. Now that gives them a whole heap of blending options. Now, this is a very simplified schematic, so if you've got hundreds and hundreds of these pits and you're using them slightly differently and you've got decades worth of stock, suddenly your blending options become fairly enormous. Now then, now that we've got all these new grains that have been added in, well, we've dispensed with the top layer so we've got space for these new grains to go back in. Genius. And so in they will go back in, pit will be sealed up again, and then it will be left for two to three months whilst it carries on in another fermentation. At which point, they empty it out again and the cycle goes on. So essentially, this just goes round, quite literally ad infinitum. There are stuff that goes back to the 1600s that's still in use. There are some that argue pits don't get into their prime until they're about 100 years old. This is, this is not even generational planning, this is kind of pan-generational planning. Um, it's a, it's a very, very unique system, but it's a very clever way of using resources. Now, whoopsie, this then takes us to our last sample. Now, this is Strong Aroma, and it's called Strong Aroma for a reason. It's punchy. And it has, it has a much kind of... So, this is intensely high in esters. The thing though is that when esters become highly, highly concentrated, they end up tasting quite weirdly different. So here we've gone on to this sort of slightly kind of rotten fruit, something that's kind of slightly kind of dead, sort of dead plant material. It's, it's really very kind of intensely and oddly exotic. Um, you're not really dealing with anything to do with the raw material. This is all about the process, which is much more about the fundamental process of that flavour creation. Um, I have a soft spot for sauce over strong. This is, believe me, believe me this is a very good sample of strong aroma. Um, and it shows the very, very typical characteristics of these things. There's something slightly kind of vinegary, all kind of like broken down in there. It's just, it's hugely complex, but 
very, very, very unusual. Um, very, very distinctly of itself, and very unmistakable. Um, It's also much higher in alcohol, but when you get it in that mouth, you have that kind of grainy, bite, cut, roundness, and you get some of that kind of soy aroma, but you also get some of that kind of like broken down fruit. It's, it is what it is. However, before you start running away again, these crazy Chinese people, what the hell are they doing? Um, who here has eaten blue cheese? Right, so you've eaten cheese through which fungus is grown, which just tastes weird, right? Why is that any less or more weird than what's going on here? And the answer is it's not. It's just one, one of those things you're more accustomed to, one of those things you're less accustomed to. The finish on this is breathtaking in its length. And breathtaking in the amount it reveals over its length, how that changes down how some of that fruit, fruit, that sort of set of fruitiness emerges and how that kind of like kind of almost raw soy kind of thing persists. Um, it is an extraordinary thing, it is very different and I think that's absolutely delicious but I can absolutely understand why anybody sitting here is going to do what you're talking about. Um, I, can, I get that, I absolutely do but all of these three are very classic representations of that style of the style they come from. Um, now you have to trust me on that because I'm suspecting you haven't had as much of these things as me and I don't tend to have a huge amount but this hopefully has given you some kind of a window into the kind of like, some of the techniques that are used but also that kind of range of flavour that can be generated from things that are much lighter to things that are profoundly intense incredibly savoury and enormously complex. They are just different um, and you have to approach them on their own terms and when you do that you can actually find some great rewards in there. Um, but think back to the first time you had a piece of whiskey or think back to the first time maybe you had coffee and then these are in themselves challenging aromas. You become used to them, you become understand where the differences and the subtleties lie. Now ultimately you may or may not like them and you know that's a personal choice. But just, just allow that to kind of grow with you because actually there's a huge amount of discovery that can be had through this category and the diversity of the dogs. So thank you all very much. I'm going to go for an enormously long sleep and I've just been along three days. Um, and if you've got any questions, please do come up and ask. I'll be very happy to at least attempt to ask them. Thank you.